Now, as concerns Texas and quantum optics Texas style, <laughs> here you see Roy with his hat bands. And in particular, he has a friend, David Lee, who you know got the prize for demonstrating superfluidity in helium-3. And so the, the quantum optics Texas style is very real. There is, of course, let's uh, get this thing yeah, corrected. There is, of course, a tradition, a flow between Texas and, and uh, Cambridge. And uh, Roy, with his 2 times 30 hat band, uh, PhD from Harvard, he is a TEOS fellow, Texas Institute for Advanced Studies. We're very proud of that. Uh, we have Dudley Hirschbach, wonderful Dudley, Harvard PhD. He's a Texas A&M professor. David Lee, I just mentioned, you might not know, but he has a bachelor's from Harvard and a PhD from Yale. How about that? He has the best of both worlds. Uh, uh, Mikhail, of course, we're very, very uh, proud of and happy for Mikhail. We've got a lot of tradition with Texas and Harvard, but we have Texas and other places as well. So quantum optics Texas style goes east, way east. Do you know who that is? Of course, Mikhail does. Vladik Latokov, long ago. And it's not Texas. And it's not Texas, but I didn't say it was. I said Texans. <laughs> So these are two of my horses, and this is my best friend back in the days when we were enjoying a kind of uh, detente between the uh, two countries. And in particular, uh, he would come to us at the Optical Sciences Center frequently. We, we loved him then. We love him now. Roy. In his old days, he was a child prodigy, as you know. He did very well, oh, but he had certain deficiencies. <laughs> now, Roy, of course, being a child prodigy, was a genius, but emotionally, he was not gifted. Emotionally, when he got this report card, his mother recorded his attitude. <laughs> this is Roy when he saw the report card. Later on, He's learning to drive. Here he is, six years old. In those days, there was no, you can't drive till you're 18 rule. And uh, of course, this is going on. You've seen this uh, photo. But what you don't know, perhaps, is that Roy showed up at Harvard at this time, age 16. He had applied uh, to Rensselaer Polytech, my alma mater. And uh, he got turned down. So his second choice was Harvard. <laughs> Rensselaer, eat your heart out. Roy, of course, had many other things going for him, like the fact that he really was a genius, as the people at Harvard quickly discovered. By his sophomore year, undergraduate, by now he's 18 by casual calculation, he had mastered all the undergraduate and graduate curriculum it was 1943, and he was called to Los Alamos. By the way, how many of you know what a GED is? This is an interesting sociological one. Nobody knows. A G Pardon? Graduate equivalent. <laughs> oh, I love these people. You guys don't live. You guys don't live in the real world. You don't live in the real world. In the real world, if you don't get a high school diploma, you go out for what is a GED? I'm not sure. General education diploma? But if you don't have a bachelor's, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have a high school diploma. You've got to get this, right? Roy didn't have an undergraduate degree, didn't have a PhD, so he went for a GED PhD from Fermi. So he got his PhD sort of de facto, working with Fermi and others up the hill at Los Alamos in the old days. This is an artistic license story. Of course, this is Roy 10 years after he was at Los Alamos. 
you've heard the story already, but he really was one of the people at Los Alamos, and by all odds, certainly the youngest scientist at Los Alamos, 18 years old. Roy, to fast forward a few years, made contributions <coughs> which have already been remarked on, and uh, I would like to shift gears a little bit and give a personal tribute to Roy. First of all, we all love the guy. He was somewhere between an uncle and a father to me. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to have Willis Lamb as a thesis advisor, and Roy as an intellectual guide long before I ever met him. So Lamb, Willis Lamb, who, <clears throat> as you know, got the Nobel Prize for doing an experiment, but he was trained as a theorist. And uh, by the way, this picture, which is a famous picture of Lamb with a kind of lamb shift glass tube set up, uh, was at his office in Columbia, and the newspaper reporters came in. He just got the Nobel Prize, and they asked him, would he please pose for them? So he reached over and took a tube, which was in his office, because it didn't work. <laughs> so this is his doesn't work photo. But um, he then came to Yale uh, years later, a decade later, and everyone wanted to work with him. Everyone wanted to work with Lamb, but Lamb, of course, had certain rules and a certain level that you had to reach before he would take you. Professor Lamb, I'd like to do my thesis for you. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't take first-year graduate students. Hmm, but I have special qualifications. Oh, well then I would be interested because I have so few qualifications myself. <laughs> True story. He had a wit. So I was fortunate enough to get a three-month stipend. He was headed off to Les Uches, 1964, and he said, okay, uh, uh, you can work for me for the summer, uh, see what you get, and then we'll discuss it again in the fall. So I had the 1963 Glauber paper, which I read and enjoyed, and worked all summer and found something that I thought was interesting. Uh, I always worked in the number representation, going back to the coherent state, at the end, because there was nobody around to teach us differently at that time. So what I found over the summer was that if I started with a radiation field and atoms, lots of atoms in the ground state, and uh, I look at the dissipation associated with that kind of, of configuration, that a coherent state is seen to remain a coherent packet as it interacts with the dissipation mechanism with the amplitude going to E0, E to the minus. And so that's what we've come to know over the years as one of the manifestations of the Glauber states. So Lamb came back, and so I showed him this. Lamb, if you showed him something that he didn't hate, the best you could get out of him was nobody can argue with that. But here, he said, OK, I'm fascinated. You're hired. <laughs> so thanks to Roy, I got a job. And at the same time, I had his lectures from Les Zouches, because Lamb was, of course, there. And they came back. And we were all reading the Glauber lectures. Uh, Glauber teaching us electrodynamics in many manifestations had great insight. And he recognized, as he says here, the only way we can do theoretical physics, make a model, and then solve the equation of motion for the density operator. These assignments are formidable in the case of the laser because of the doggone nonlinearity. The nonlinearity plays an important role. More on that in a moment. Dead on right. How could he be so right? I'm not, still not sure. But we all love this picture, which appeared in Physics Today many years ago. When did it appear in Physics Today? 70s? Yeah. Something like that. So Pauli, oh, Roy, of course, went to Los Alamos, 
did his, uh, his time, came back, got his degree under Schwinger, and then went off for a postdoc uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies, and then went to Pauli. So here he is, a photographer on a picnic with Pauli, and Pauli is enjoying kicking the soccer ball around, and Roy has this huge big camera, characteristic <laughs> of the days, and Pauli kicks the ball at the camera <laughs> and hits this expensive camera with Roy behind the camera. And uh, this is the result, a <laughs> prize-winning photograph that uh, we all uh, enjoy. Pauli must have been something of an athlete if he could handle the ball that way. In particular, then, I, with the guidance of Willis, started working on the quantum theory of the laser and found that the distribution is indeed dominated by this nonlinearity, which is, you know, the Robbie saturation nonlinearity. When an atom undergoes a stimulated emission process, you have gain, but then shortly thereafter, it's an absorber and it sucks up radiation. So you work out, make a model, solve for the photon statistics, and you find such a simple expression involving the linear gain, involving new over Q of the cavity, the loss, and this nonlinear parameter. Uh, we published this for the first time in 65 at the first PQE conference. We're now at the 43rd PQE conference. But uh, the interesting nonlinearity is to be, keep that in mind, please. And off-diagonal elements are also interesting, and more about that later, or perhaps not during this talk. Let's, let's not do it today. Uh, John is trying to get us to supper, so I'll try to help him. Fast forward a few years. A couple decades later, we have these wonderful experiments, thanks to people here in Cambridge, primarily, and at, at Boulder. And we find, for the second time, a BEC. Where was the first time? First time, 1985, John Reppy at Cornell actually saw Bose-Einstein condensation in liquid helium. More about that later, but uh, maybe not more about it later, but it's a fact. <laughs> So let's, let's take the Repi problem. So he has a box with n atoms in the box. And uh, you ask how many atoms are in the ground state as compared with the excited states. So that's the condensate. And so Einstein teaches us that the average number of particles in the ground state is the total number in the box times 1 minus t over the critical temperature, the three halves. So this is the famous. Einstein result, which he obtained using the grand canonical ensemble and setting the chemical potential equal to zero, which you really shouldn't do, but he being the genius that he is, it gets essentially the right answer. And now you find later, later in, in the sense of months after the experiments, people had the insight, the notion, the wrong-mindedness, the correct deep insight, all these things are true, that the BEC is like an atom laser. Now, Willis, as you may know, uh, was a very uh, uh, stubborn guy, and he didn't like the word photon. And the reason he didn't like it is because he himself had been misled thinking about the radiation field as a beam of photons. Peter Franken was taking a sabbatical in Oxford, where Lamb was the theoretical uh, chair. And he came to Willis one day and said, I think I'd like to do nonlinear physics with these new laser beams. So I'll take a ruby laser and send it into a crystal. And maybe I send in red light, and I get out green light. And Lamb said, no, it won't work, because as you send in this beam of light, the chances that two photons will overlap in one element of phase space is very small. So it won't happen. Well, 
you know the rest of the story. It did happen. And Lamb then said, and to do penance, he did the 1964 classical theory of the laser, semi-classical, in which the field is treated classically, but the atoms are cornered mechanically. So from this perspective, he had a very valid point to make and a very uh, good lesson to teach us. Namely, be careful how you think about electromagnetic problems. And uh, in particular, the way to think about them for the most part is don't think about photons, think about radio waves, okay? But then he went on and thought about deeply each of the problems that would come to the fore when we would see things like this. The BEC is an atom laser. And so he says, first of all, well, that's ridiculous. We know that the statistical distribution of photons, the photon statistics, is dominated by the nonlinearity. Thank you, Professor Glauber. There's no nonlinearity apparent in an ideal Bose gas, right? The atoms aren't even colliding, and yet we think we're going to get condensation because, well, they do interact with the wall, but not with each other. First question. Second question, well, if there is a BEC, what is the atomic statistical distribution? What's the probability of finding N0 atoms in the ground state? Third point, as Pierre mentions, he says, if there is an atom laser, I want one that emits gold atoms, right? <laughs> so anyway, all this is in the air. The time is like, oh, I don't know, 68 or something like that. You never get away from your thesis advisor. So Lamb called me up and he said, I want you to do the quantum theory of a Bose condensate. So I figured it had been done. So I called Roy, who really taught a wonderful statistical mechanics course. Sudak Prasad had his lecture notes and shared them all with us. And I called Roy and I said, okay, well, what is the statistical distribution? And Roy gave us very good advice. He says, nobody knows. If you're working with the canonical ensemble, fixed in atoms, it's a very hard problem. And you don't know even what the fluctuations are. You don't know the partition function for the ideal gas. So we don't know the answer to this question. So let's work on it a little bit. And then it was his suggestion, go ahead, work on it. Let's take this model, namely, that if we have atoms in the excited manifold, and they emit a phonon falling to the ground state, that's gain. Gain in the sense of stimulated emission, even though the process is not laser-like in, in that uh, manifestation. These are phonons, after all, nothing to do with, with laser. They're incoherent. And you can have absorption knocking us to the excited state. And you must do the, grand, the canonical ensemble constraint such that you add up all the atoms in every level and it has to be the total number. Do that. Work it out. Write the master equation, solve it, do it carefully, and lo and behold, you get exactly the same answer that you got for the laser. And the nonlinearity is now a manifestation of particle constraint. You only have a certain number of particles, so in some sense it's a little like the Rabi nonlinearity, atom goes to the ground state, now becomes an absorber. You have an atom drop to the condensate, you have fewer atoms in the excited state. So in some after the fact reasonable way, uh, this is a, a manifestation of uh, nonlinearity, of a nonlinearity. So I sent this off to Tucson. And Willis was skeptical and not, not very uh, pleased. First of all, this really makes it look like the condensate is a bunch of photons. Or look back at the laser. It makes the laser look like it's a bunch of particles. So the atom, photon, photon is a fuzzy little ball perspective is, is kind of supported by this result. Uh, so anyway, 
I wrote the paper, and I put both of our names on it. His name first, of course, because I wasn't sure it was right. <laughs> I sent it to him, and he said, well, take my name off of it. And so we argued for a while, and he said, well, look, take my name off of it, and we can still be friends. So <laughs> the story goes on. Roy Lauber has so many insights, so many ways of coming up with the right point of view that it's uh, amazing. I'll give you an ex another example. Uh, I love Cromers. Uh, who is Cromers? You ask a graduate student today, Tommy Cromers. And he says, WKB Cromers, right? No. Cromers is to Heisenberg as de Broglie is to Schrodinger. Cromers and Heisenberg wrote that famous paper, the Cromers Heisenberg paper, and he's really a magnificent, if somewhat if absolutely underrated physicist. Well, he, write, he writes in his quantum mechanics book now that we understand quantum mechanics very well, uh, to what extent can I think of the Maxwell equations as a kind of Schrodinger equation for light? That's a fair question. He says, no, you can't, because electric fields and magnetic fields have sines and cosines. They have both e to the minus i and e to the plus i nu t parts, while matter wave has only e to the minus i nu t, right? That's a good answer. On the other hand, Professor Glauber says, a photon is what a photodetector detects. I have always appreciated this perspective, and taking that perspective, as he himself does in, in uh, his lectures, we write the probability for a photodetector emitting a photoelectron in which the atom, think of it that way as, as he taught us, uh, is at position R, and the state of the radiation field, let's take one photon, is psi. So this is the probability, proportional to the probability of exciting a photoelectron. Now, oh, by the way, of course, the electric field uh, positive frequency part goes like some number that times the annihilation operator for the mode in question and uh, some normal mode amplitude and e to the minus i nu t. Fair enough. Come back up here, put in a complete set of states. But since this is a one photon state, only the vacuum will survive. So vacuum, vacuum, broquette. Therefore, we have the psi function mod squared is what it is that we're detecting. So we're led to define the electric field associated with a single photon. Thus, this is exactly what we do for electrons, right? We have some state psi of the electron. We have the annihilation operator in the sense of side uh, annihilation operator uh, formed in precisely the same way, except that we're annihilating electrons in some momentum state. So this is the single photon wave function. And now you take a page out of Oppenheimer's book. Did you know Oppenheimer was Lamb's thesis advisor? So I asked him once, what did Oppenheimer say to you when you got the Nobel Prize? And he said, well, first time I saw him after the prize was at Columbia in 1960. I got onto the elevator. He was in the elevator. He looked at me and he said, don't you wish you'd gone to Los Alamos? <laughs> He said, I said, no, because then I wouldn't have learned about hydrogen. I got off the elevator. He got off the elevator. It's the last time they ever spoke. <laughs> More about that at coffee. <laughs> Oppenheimer was, I think, the first to point out that you can write the Maxwell equations for the electric and magnetic field in a kind of Dirac form for a massless particle. And I haven't read his paper, but if you just massage the uh, equations a little bit, 
where phi is now the electric field photon. You have a corresponding magnetic field for a single photon, and you can straighten out the math if you're inclined uh, with an eye on the clock, but it's not. S is now a 3x3 three by three spin, a 3x3 three three matrix <clears throat> like unto neutrino, where this would be, of course, 4x4. Four four. And uh, in that sense, this equation for the photon is very much like the Schrodinger equation in the spirit of, of uh, the neutrino being a Schrodinger equation, a Dirac equation uh, for that particular massless particle. Oh, okay. So the bottom line is, as I'm uh, trying to sell the story here, is that we should think of the photon as having particle-like attributes to the same extent that we think of the neutrino as having such characteristics. And certainly, the correspondence between the atom laser, Bose condensate, and the photon configuration of the same uh, makes strong arguments for teaching this kind of, of uh, mindset. This precludes, of course, anyone from telling us that a photon should be viewed as a beam, many particle, many photon uh, uh, beam adding up to give us the laser. It, of course, gives us a Glauber state in, in that sense of, of the word, and it's more like the Maxwell field than it is like a beam of particles. Well, okay. So finally, in the last, so I think I've used 25 minutes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what do you think? I think you have 10 more minutes. You think I have 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. I'll take seven. <laughs> so let, let me tell you about what we've been doing within the context of single photon super super and sub -radiant. So you know Dickey, he teaches us that he, I don't want to marginalize Dickey. Dickey, in a beautiful paper, teaches us thinking about many particle systems in which the atoms are close together in terms of radiating multiplets and non-radiating or sub-radiating configurations is the way to go. So the four possible states of a two-atom system are best represented this way. In particular, put the atomic configuration in this state. Now the decay rate will be twice as fast as it is for a single atom. If we're in this state, we don't decay at all. Go now to an extended ensemble of atoms in which the atoms are not close together, as they were in Dickey's paper, but spread a <clears throat> over a large distance where large means that uh, we're having each atom uh, at some fraction of a wavelength, maybe several wavelengths away from any other atom, but the total size of the cloud is small compared with the photon wave packet. By that I mean small compared with the speed of light times one over gamma. Okay, solve that problem. Now, what problem? Start off with one photon in the n particle ensemble in which you've prepared the single photon Dickey state with these factors, where k0 r1 is, if you massage it a little bit, a time factor. I can write this as a time t1 uh, times a frequency, of course. And uh, t1 will then be r1 over c. So we call this a timed Dickey state. Calculate the emission rate, and you find that the uh, uh, rate of emission from this ensemble doesn't go like n times the number of atoms. I don't think I even said, sorry, put all the atoms close together. Calculate the same thing that you were asking about the two atom problem, right? And now you find that that single photon configuration decays with a rate n times gamma. Am I clear? I better be. So, 
do this problem for three atoms. Okay, so now I have four states here, and I have j equals a half, a couple of subradiant states out here. So now I'm here, put the atoms into this configuration, where it's up, down, and now I have one more of these, right? So this state, this single photon state, decays three times faster than a single atom. For n atoms, then the single photon state decays n times faster. And now for the ensemble of a timed decay configuration, I don't have just n times gamma, but n times gamma essentially times lambda squared over a, the diffraction factor. And here is the most interesting thing that comes out of that to my way of thinking. Suppose you go back and you consider cavity QED, put one atom in a configuration such that it sees n photons, and ask what's the probability that the atom uh, will be in the ground state after some time. So the probability of exciting the atom is going to go like such a factor. Matrix element, electric field per photon, where V is the volume, and the square root of the number. And as Jeff was emphasizing, you want small volume for large uh, Rabi frequencies. So the well-known cavity QED result is to be compared now with a result obtained by taking the cloud to be large compared with the photon wave packet so that I stretch it out to be two meters instead of two centimeters. The wave packet might be, uh, under some conditions, a fraction of, of a meter. Let's go 10 meters and a, a few centimeters. Then what will happen is that I ask, what's the probability that a photon is emitted? And what I find is that that configuration in which I prepared single photon timed Dickey state in the particular state that we were talking about, okay, one photon absorbed, that state decays in a way that's very similar to what you see in cavity QED, except that the volume now is the volume of the cloud, the size of the cloud. And the number of photons is replaced by the number of atoms. This kind of collective effect is something that uh, uh, I find very intriguing. And the fact that it comes out in such a way is a source of, of uh, uh, many interesting effects. But let's now go to subradiance. And let's ask, how can I get a configuration of atoms so that I can store a photon for a long time, then switch? and have the photon emitted. So I want to prepare a collective ensemble. Uh, OK, so single particle Dickey. So I start here. I decay n times faster. If I put the atom in any of these states, yeah, it'll decay. it won't decay. OK, but there's no sense in which I can store a photon here and then do something to knock me over here and decay n times faster. That's not going to work for you. But what will work is this. Let's suppose that without going through the details very much, I have single photon preparation. Send in a single photon red, OK? And I do a Raman excitation. And I prepare the timed Dickey state, thin, unlikely, thin medium, unlikely that it's going to absorb a photon. I do post-selection, and if I have perfect photodetection, every photon that goes through here and causes a click on the detector, I throw that experiment away. I do it again. Sometime, I don't get a count. Oh, now I know I've prepared that timed Dickey state. And I will expect and, in fact, uh, find that there is a collective emission at the frequency K, C, K0. OK, now, put in a pi phase shift 
for the red light. Do the same experiment many, many times. When you don't get a click, no clicks, now tell me that I've got plus on this side, minus on this side for the atomic configuration. Up, 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 come on. See, I've got now such a state, such a state, called a minus state. So for the atoms 1 to n over 2, here on the left-hand side, I get just the time Dickey state with the right factors, some on p. But over here on the right-hand side, I'm summing from n over 2 plus 1 to n, but with a minus sign because of that pi phase shifter. Now, what about the decay rate from here to there? Turns out that you get this ubiquitous sort of factor times n for here minus n for there. Oh, that's good. Oh, but not so good because now I have plus gamma. So that what this is saying is that the atomic radiation, and it occurs for plus and minus ace, the system is radiating off to the side, and you can't stop that. But you can stop the radiation, which is collectively radiating in this direction, okay? Well, but if I prepare the state that we just saw on the previous view graph, and now I come in with a pi over 2 phase shifter, where are we? Here, suppose that I've prepared the ensemble of atoms in this state. Then on just the right-hand side, I drive my system 2 pi through some A prime state. Then I introduce another minus sign, and now I've got a system which will decay very quickly. OK, that happens, and that's fine, except that you haven't stored for longer than an atomic lifetime. Well, you might like to store for longer than an atomic lifetime, indeed. And so I'd like to see, is, is there some way of beating this limit? The answer is yes. And uh, you, you can get this if you talk to Jeff Kimball at breakfast in Purdue, but actually it's due to Serge Roche. And uh, the hint is the following. If I prepare atoms on a cylinder, and I phase the atoms. I don't know if you can read this. This is KZJ, and I phase them e to the i n phi j, OK? And then I pick that particular spacing. I pick the index n, OK? This is the periodicity as I go around the circle. I find that the decay rate now goes like a Bessel function j of n. And that has zeros, dead zeros. And that means that I've quenched this gamma. And now you do it numerically as well, and you find that, yes, indeed, you've been able to get a zero. And I would love to talk to you about that. Uh, I, the, the rule for giving a talk is, of course, that you should talk about things that you understand very well. But then at the end, say something that you don't understand. Well, this is something that I believe to be true. The mathematics is solid. But how in the world can it be that by messing with the atoms along the axis, I'm killing emission off to the side? It's not photonic band gap logic. It's a very interesting kind of super subradiance. So let me conclude there. And thank you, Roy, for so many insights. And from your Texas fan club, uh, sponsored by your colleague Dudley and your admirers Wolfgang Schleich, Frank Narducci, and others. <laughs> Thank you, Roy.